Welcome to our listeners and viewers today. Uh, my name is Brad Elder. I'm neurosurgery faculty at The Ohio State University. Uh, today, I have the distinct honor and uh, privilege of welcoming Dr. Nino Kioka to our fireside chat as part of a series entitled AANS Leaders in Neurosurgery Interview Series. Uh, a, as a brief introduction, Dr. Kioka did his MD PhD uh, at UT Medical School in Houston. Uh, incidentally, his PhD thesis was the molecular basis of retinoic acid action. Uh, he then performed his internship at uh, UT Houston, followed by neurosurgical residency at Mass General Hospital. He stayed on at Harvard as faculty for eight years and was then named professor and chair of neurological surgery at The Ohio State University in 2004 where he stayed until uh, 2012, at which point he was recruited back to Boston. Currently, he is neurosurgeon in chief and chair of the Department of Neurosurgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He is co-director uh, for the Institute of Neurosciences uh, and the Harvey W. Cushing Professor of Neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Kioka is a true surgeon scientist. His lab focuses on developing novel biologic agents and genetic therapies uh, into treatments for malignant brain tumors. His work has led to numerous patents, numerous clinical trials, and over 300 peer-reviewed publications. He has an extensive track record of funding, including a program project grant involving eight PIs and four, at four different institutions. Moreover, Dr. Kiyoka has been able to uh, balance his clinical and scientific efforts with leadership pursuits at the national and international level, including being president of the Society for Neuro-Oncology and president of the American Academy of Neurological Surgery. So as uh, everything I have mentioned is really just the tip of the iceberg, and it begs the first question that I'll ask uh, in, in this fireside chat is, how do you balance all the different facets of what you do. Well, first of all, Brad, thank you so much for interviewing me and for doing this. It is truly an honor and probably a pinnacle of my career to be doing this fireside chat amongst all the other luminaries that have been interviewed and are part of this series. So um, I guess I would say like the old movies, I'm not worthy. <laughs> again. Uh, and I think the issue of balance is a, is a, is truly important. Um, yeah, I never thought about it for a long time. I always thought that um, as a neurosurgeon and as well as a scientist and interested in education and leadership, you should just be able to do it all. Um, but clearly, does that that does provide um, some issues in terms of balancing other activities in your life. Um, and uh, I've come. Although I did not really appreciate that early on, I would have been more, I've been always one of those types of people that just worked all the time. Um, I did miss out on a lot of things that happened in my family, in my life. And uh, and you try to make it up now in a lot, in a lot of ways. Um, but um, I think that having people around you that understand this, I have a fantastic family. You, you met my wife, I've got great kids. And they just know that's what dad does and that and they accepted it. And so somehow I got away with it. Uh, but I would say to all my younger faculty and younger people, you know, really take care of other parts of your life. Um, you don't want to get to a near point in life where you're just alone and not have anybody else around you to love you. In terms of balancing um, research, your clinical activities, your leadership activities, there's really no magic formula and there's not a, there's not like a 30%, 40%, 30%. I never see that as, as being a way to think about it. I see it more as it changes with time. And there may be some times when there's a grant that's due and, you know, that may be a hundred percent of the time you're, you're going to be doing the grant for, for a week, for example. And then there are patients that need to be seen and especially they can't wait. And so a lot of times those activities have to be put apart and you have to take care of patients. Um, so I think it's more of a balancing act and I'm not sure that there's a particular formula that one can use. I think everybody adapts to it the best they can and I've adapted to it the best I can. 
Well, let's, I mean, we're talking about the here and now. Let's, I'd, I'd like to maybe take our listeners and myself back to maybe the beginning. So how, how did you choose neurosurgery? Was there, was there something that drew you to neurosurgery? Did you, were you one of the, I always knew kind of folks or kind of tell me the story there? Yeah. You know, um, it's actually pretty uh, trivial, but, but there was not like a magic moment. Uh, in medical school, uh, I remember that in our uh, first year, we had our, um, a, our neurobiology course. And uh, I liked the neurobiology course. And I pers- in specific, I liked one crazy hippie professor who was a psychiatrist. He was a biologic psychiatrist. He was British and he'd come uh, to teach. He had long hair, it was a hippie, he wore sandals. Uh, he said the most irreverent things during the lecture that made everybody laugh. At, uh, nowadays, he'd be written up and expelled. Because <laughs> some, some of the things he said would be thought of as being irascible or whatever or hateful. But he made, he made bio- the biologic psychiatry of the brain or the biologic uh, uh, components of the brain very understandable. And uh, so I became very attracted to that. And I became very attracted to pathways and how neurobiology worked. And so even from the first year, I thought, you know, I think I want to do something in the neurological sciences. And because of this professor, I said, I think I, I want to be a psychiatrist. Psychiatry seems like a lot of fun. And so, in fact, the first um, in our third year, the first uh, um, the first uh, 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 rotation I did was psychiatry. And I did not like it. Uh, I just it was not me. I just uh, realized that uh, what attracted to me to psychiatry was really this professor, this role model, uh, as, or more more than him as a role model, it was more his intellect, you know, how he, he put forth things. But this this is not really the clinical practice of psychiatry. And so then I was lost. I, I really did not know what to do. And I still remember after that rotation in psychiatry saying, okay, now what am I going to do? <laughs> And, and then I did general surgery. That was my second rotation. And I loved general surgery. And um, in fact, you know, you always talk about mentors. One of the mentors that I had in general surgery was my chief resident. His name was Chip Shoba. And Chip went on for an illustri- illustrious career, including being dean at the Ohio State University Medical Center when I was chairman. Oh, wow. Uh, he became dean at Dartmouth as well. And Chip, uh, Chip really, uh, he was a general surgeon, but I, I just liked the, the, the surgical approach to things. It just seemed much more consistent with my personality. And at that, that was the point when I had this light come up in my head. I said, ah, psychiatry, surgery, there's really no psychosurgery, but there's neurosurgery. It turns out that unfortunately, at my medical school, there was no, uh, neurosurgery was a small division of general surgery. There was really no residency program. And um, so it was tough to really find the appropriate role model uh, there. And it was not really a rotation you did until your fourth year. And you had to choose it as doing uh, in part as part of neurology would do two weeks of neurosurgery. And that's what I did. And I loved it. And uh, I was lucky enough to get a sub eye um, at uh, actually at Mass General Hospital. So I went to Mass General Hospital uh, and and that was a you know, a real neurosurgery program with residents. And I spent um, the month of July there and it was great. I loved it. I thought this is what I want to do. And so that was it. The rest is history, right? The rest is history. We, you talked about mentorship uh, in medical school. If you, if you think about kind of the different uh, stages of, of your career, wh- who would, who would you, what would you, say about mentorship during residency when you were a resident? Yeah, I know there were several mentors. And, and, and you know, when people talk about mentorship, um, to me, it's always, you'll never find the person, at least in my mind, you never find a person that encompasses everything that you need. And I always felt that there were different individuals or different parts of my career that really mattered. Uh, I think that uh, one of the reasons that I attracted to Mass General Hospital is as part of my PhD, I was interested in genetics, and uh, that was the early days of gene jockeying or, or cloning genes. I was really interested in that. 
So in my mind, I thought I was going to want it to be in a neurosurgery program where there was actually active genetic research. Um, and as I was looking around the country, I really did not find any. I mean, we're talking about the late 1980s. So there was really nothing there. But then I ran, I, as I was doing a literature search, I ran into the name of Bob Martuza, who had just published a paper in Nature in 1987 about cloning the, or not cloning the gene, but finding the genomic locus for acoustic schwannomas, vestibular schwannomas. And I said, aha, here's the neurosurgeon who's doing genetic research. And, uh, and that's what really attracted me to coming to Mass General. And so I would say that Bob Martuza early on was my uh, mentor or my role model for the idea of a neurosurgeon scientist that could, that could uh, combine um, a neurosurgical interest in acoustic schwannomas with a genetic interest, what actually causes acoustic schwannomas. Um, and then there were other mentors. So for example, during our residency, the there were a couple of people that really uh, were uh, 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 allowed me to operate and allowed me to taught me how to operate. And you know, we're, there were several of them uh, in surgery. So, for example, I learned a lot about spine surgery. And believe it or not, I did a lot of spine surgery as a faculty member from Larry Borges, uh, who's still a Mass General. I thought he was an amazing spine surgeon. Um, and uh, he was very attentive to detail. In terms of brain surgery, Bob Ogeman was uh, the uh, the person that trained almost every neurosurgeon that came through Mass General in terms of um, uh, how to take care of, of uh, in a methodical way, how to do an operation from step A to the end. Um, but there were several, and uh, you know, I always uh, and Leo of just pointing out one or two people. But there were several. Reese Cosgrove was actually now one of my faculty. Uh, was very young at that time, and uh, and he was uh, he was a faculty member when I was a, re a senior resident. He taught me a lot of tricks and maneuvers. He was very slick, um, and um, and again, I know I'm leaving several, but even Nick Zervas, uh, who was our chairman at that time. He taught me some aspects of leadership that I have come to appreciate now as I'm becoming older as a chairman, uh, which you really have to do with really taking care of your people and just uh, mm -hmm. uh, being very even keeled in that respect. So so you're, you're through residency and um, your faculty, and then you make the transition to being chair. Yes. And talk about that transition at... at, at at what point do you decide to make that leap, you know, all, to to fly over country, right? And 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 what what is that transition like? You know, it's, there's for for listeners and viewers that are potentially interested in becoming chair or having leadership positions. What are are there things you give up when you do that? Are there are there things? I mean, what what is the transition like? Or what was it like for you? And and how would you advise people? How would you tell people about it yeah so i can tell you my transition uh, why i did it and how i did it but that is not why i want people to do it because i think i did it for the wrong reasons in a lot of ways i'm very happy i did but my uh, my uh when i thought about chairmanship and leadership at that time and again we're talking about the late 1990s early 2000s so i've been a faculty for some time and to me, I felt that I was, uh, I was not, I was uh, plateauing in terms of my personal development. I wanted more lab space. I wanted more money for my lab. I wanted to have more OR time. I wanted to see more patients with brain tumors. Uh, uh, so I wanted more and more and more, but it was all a very selfish reason. It was because of me. And I said, wouldn't it be great to be a chair? That way I have total control over what I want to do. And, and that was the, sort of the selfish, and I must say, very naive reason of being a chair. Uh, and, uh, and clearly, there are other there are things that you say, great, I'll be a chair. I'll be amongst the leaders of neurosurgery. Everybody will know my name. i uh, get all these accolades, and uh, everything's going to be swell. You know, so, it's, so that, tell you the truth, that was really a lot with the, what drove me. It was this ambitious ambitious selfish pursuit in a lot of ways and uh and i think the uh 
as you know, uh, uh, Ohio State had gone through some tough times and, uh, you know, they were looking for somebody. Actually, they were, I almost want to say they were desperate for somebody to come there because it was a division of surgery, but a lot of the surgeons had left. There was n- nobody left there at this point, uh, only Dr. John McGregor mm-hmm. and Carol Miller, uh, where they had brought back from retirement. Um, and they had a full residency program. Uh, the chair of general surgery there, Chris Ellison, was, you know, you really wanted to get somebody there. And uh, and they saw this young whippersnapper from Harvard and who, was, who seemed ready for the move. And I'd met him before because I'd gone there to give a couple of talks. And, and they really courted me. And the dean at that time, whose name was Fred Sanfilippo, who came from Hopkins, was very, very uh, charming. And he really put the full court press for me to come there. I don't think they even had a search committee. They they just they just asked me <laughs> if, if I wanted to be their chair. And I said, well, this is great. Somebody actually wants me. <laughs> so so uh, I said, yes. I said, yes, that'd be great. And, uh, and um, I think I understand it was a bit of a shock to the system in Mass Channel because nobody ever left there to become a chair at Ohio State. Um, there was some previous, um, uh, I had heard that Roberto Harris had looked at that chair job, uh, uh, that chief job when Will Hunt, uh, Bill Hunt had retired like 15 years before me, but it was a different program at that time, it was really a full program. Um, I quickly learned when I came to Ohio State that it was not about me. And the quickest you learn that, the better. What mm-hmm. I learned is that when you're a chair, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with everybody that um, that you lead. It has to do with your team. It becomes the residents. It becomes about the faculty. It becomes about the administrators you are. It becomes about the university. It becomes about the medical center. In a way, you're the last one to, you're the last one that matters. Your goal is really to make everybody else flourish and shine around you. Uh, and you're there to really um, provide the leadership for that. So I almost buy into a, a lot of the concepts behind servant leadership. You know, you're there to really uh, serve the team. You're almost like the coach of the team. Uh, but ultimately, the team is what wins. It's not you that wins. Uh, I mean, you do have to provide role models, uh, a role modership. I mean, you cannot be, you still have to operate. You still have to get grants. You still have to get research but it is, has nothing to do with you. And so when I tell my young, you know, younger individuals, younger faculty that are looking at chairs, I try to tell them what I thought was a, was a chair. And now you're ready to give up a little bit of that selfish um, pursuit of your own excellence to make everybody else around you excellent. And, uh, and I think if you're ready to do that, then by all, God, by all means do it. Um, and it's been interesting that some of my faculty that have thought to, of wanting to be chairs, after I spoke to speak to them, they actually uh, uh, decide, maybe I'll do this for a few more years. <laughs> well, let, let's shift gears a little bit. We've, we've walked through kind of, kind of a, from a bird's eye view, some of your career. What, what do you want, um, as, as we all look back and, and celebrate the career of Nino Kiyoka, what do you want your legacy to be? Well, first of all, I hope I still have a few more years to go. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's, I've not thought about legacy that much. I think that at the end of the day, um, I just want to be known as somebody that contributed, uh, that I contributed either by educating residents. I mean, I think one of the, one of the most, my most favorite moments, there have been a couple, of, one of my most favorite moments was a few years ago, one of our residents here who I must say was not one of our more excellent ones, and I'm not naming names, um, but um, ended up uh, graduating and ended up going in actually in private practice. One of the few, we're we're known to put our academic residents, but we used one of the few ones that was in private practice. And about four months later, he sent me a text and he said, Dr. Kiyoka, I took out this low-grade glioma from a patient. I took it out exactly the same way as you taught me, and the case went great. Thank you. I did not realize how much I learned under you. I think that that was mm-hmm. one of the most 
my most favorite moments in life. Yeah. <laughs> Knowing that I that I did that. I, I don't actually remember how I taught him. I don't remember what the cases were. I know he was scrub with us. I know I let him do some, but uh uh, I I just thought that you know there is some there's some value in in the way we do we train our residents, um, so I think that that is important. Um, like we all have this pursuit of wanting to be known for something. Uh, you know, I've had a, uh, a illustrious research career in the sense I published a lot and I got a lot of grants in trying to find uh, the why glioblastomas grow and finding treatments for glioblastomas. So yes, I would love to be known as somebody that actually found something that would work against this devastating disease. Uh, but um, as you know, that is a really tall order. And um, uh, if, if I think that uh, that's the one thing that I wish <laughs> I could have contributed more to, because you see these patients with this devastating disorder and you feel that you're not really doing much for them. What what are your if if you think about just your research focus? What what are your goals for the next say five to ten years? What 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 do you think? How do you see that unfolding? Yeah, you know, I spent I spent about twenty five years, thirty years building a NIH funded research lab, and uh, uh, we've we've worked on models, uh, in vitro models, mouse models. Lots of mice models, uh, cultured models, even using computer models of this disease. Uh, and the reason being is that that's the best we had. I've come to realize in the last five years that in glioblastoma, I think one of our major impediments has been the fact that we've not been able to do clinical trials for this disease where we can get a lot of information back. Uh, if I think about this, you will never think about doing a clinical trial for a liquid tumor like multiple myeloma, leukemia, without doing serial bone marrow biopsies, for example, to see if the drug that you gave really hit the stem cells. And even for some of the other cancers like breast cancers, you get serial, serial biopsies of these tumors. Uh, for glioblastoma, we've not been really able to do that. Now, people have, you know, we did one of the first window of opportunity trials when I was at Mass General Hospital, where we were interested in applying a gene therapy where we injected the gene therapy vector into the tumor stereotactically, then came back five days later, took out the tumor to ask how much gene expression there was. Uh, but again, the, the technology to assess what you're doing was were fairly crude. In the last five years, with the advent of single cell RNA sequencing, a lot of the genomic sequencing, the spatial transcriptomics that you can do in tissue, the correlations between the tissue, CSF, peripheral blood monolucular cells, uh, really, I've, I think I've expanded our ability to do a lot even with little tissue. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm pushing in my research now to really push things from the lab into clinical trials as fast as possible and trying to do some early clinical trials of whatever therapeutic you're using to ask the question whether those therapeutics are really doing what you're supposed to do, either by doing window of opportunity trials or even serial biopsy trials where you can get biopsies of the tissue as a part of the treatment. And that's what we're currently doing. And I, I really wanna do that for the next 10 years if I can get the funding to do it. Um, how would you think, or what would you say, um, how would you answer the question, how has neurosurgery in, in your career, how does, how does an academic neurosurgeon, how has that person changed over time? What was the life of an academic neurosurgeon 30 years ago? What is the life of an academic surgeon now? And how do you see it changing going forward? Is there, is this a, evolution and how and how have you evolved uh, similarly i think there's been an evolution because i think when i uh, when i started researching neurosurgery and also being a clinical neurosurgeon it was a little bit unheard of you had uh, neurosurgeons that just stayed in the lab primarily and the clinical neurosurgeons and there was a little bit of a uh, a notion that neurosurgeons cannot really do research if you're if you're 
if you're clinically busy. I think that's evolved dramatically because now there's a lot of research can be that can be done on human patients. If you think about the what's happening in function, the functional arena, what's happening in epilepsy, what's happening in tumors now, uh, you know, the most exciting findings, the things that are getting published in nature, cell and science come from clinical trials or even NO equal one patients uh, that, uh, that uh, where you use molecular, sophisticated electrophysiological techniques and technologies uh, to answer questions that you can't really answer in mice or even IUM primates. Uh, so I think the, there is a true evolution of the academic scientist neurosurgeon that can do things clinically as part of their research. And there we possess an enormous advantage because nobody else can do that. And, uh, you know, I just talked to one of my young faculty and he just got an R1 uh, based on a clinical device that he's going to input in patients with glioblastoma, first time in, three percentile. Uh, you know, so, um, and I think what the power of that is that he's going to get human patient data to ask questions that are much more relevant than what you could ever do in a mouse. So I see a bright future for that. And then what is your, talk to me about your philosophy. You've, you've, when you, when you came to Ohio State in 2004, you mentioned there were just a couple faculty. And so you had to build a clinical team. Uh, you had to build your lab. You had, you've had to build teams. Then you made the transition uh, back to Brigham and Women's uh, 10 years ago, 10, 10 and a half years ago, maybe. Yeah. Um, Talk, talk, talk about building a team. What is it that you look for in your clinical team? How do you, how do you go about building your teams? Yeah, I think, first of all, uh, the person is so important. And, and, uh, and it took me a long time to realize that, uh, you know, how important it is to have uh, people that are collegial and that uh, people talk about a fit. Uh, and I don't mean this as an exclusive thing. I mean, truly, that can fit into the team. So, Brad, when I hired you, I knew you were perfect for our team at Ohio State. You would be perfect for our team here as a Brigham. Uh, I think uh, I think you have that right uh, uh, combination of technical expertise, knowing how to deal with colleagues, uh, personal behavior and personal characteristics and traits that really are really important in a, in a team, in a team approach. Uh, I think it's like building every team. Uh, you know, clearly you have to fulfill every specialty that you have to deal with, especially in academic center. And there may be some that are much more uh, clinically oriented, some much more research oriented. So you have to have a nice combination of that. Um, but ultimately, I'd prefer having two people that do similar things, but they are congenial with each other and congenial with the team than having uh, two very selfish superstars that are leading the team astray. And so, and so I think that that is part important. At I State, we had to build a team from zero to what you and um, Russ Lanz are there and others have built a, you know, to a fantastic department and you continue to do that. And I'm so proud of that. Here, when I came to the Brigham, there was, a, I mean, this department was, 100 years old, Harvey Cushing founded it. So there was a lot of tradition, history, and legacy. Um, but there were some things we had to fix, and I had to hire some additional faculty. And I always, always follow that same rule, which is you know, trying to find people that are congenial with each other, that can be colleagues. Uh, I like the idea of having people that come from different programs. So trying to avoid too much inbreeding, because I think inbreeding tends to make people in one certain way. Um, and hopefully using people that can fulfill certain needs that are required in the department. Do you have any aspirations to take these team building skills to kind of a different venue? Do you want to be, do you want to be Dean? Do you want uh, to be any, any of those types of leadership positions? Yeah, that is a great question because, uh, you know, when I became chair at the Brigham, I, you know, I started thinking, do I really want to be a chair forever? Should I take the next step and, you know, become a dean, become a president, become director of a cancer hospital? And uh, for a long time, I thought that that would be my future because I thought that maybe, maybe I, I can do that. But again, 
unlike the first time I took a leadership position, I knew this was not because of selfish reasons. It was more because I thought, you know, I think I did a good job building a team at Ohio State. And as I stayed at the Brigham for a few years, things were coming out nicely. I said, maybe I can do that in other settings as well. Um, so, yes, I did look at some deanships. I did look at some of these higher positions. Um, and in the end, uh, I didn't get selected or chosen, which is a good thing, because actually I think I would probably be been unhappy. Because at the ultimate, the, in the ultimate, I like the department. I like being the leader of a department. But being a chair still allows you to do two, two things that I still like. I still like doing research. And I still like to operate. And I think at the moment where you become a dean, where you have to supervise other departments, you just are not going to have the bandwidth or the wherewithal to keep up your lab and to keep up doing your surgery. Um, and uh, I think that the happiest I am is when I do surgery and and uh, the patient does really well. That is the best feeling in the world, especially if it's something that you're worried or concerned about. Uh, in research, when I when there's a when there's a result that one of my postdocs brings me that confirms what we were looking for, it's a great result. I mean, that's my happiest. Um, and not having those things to propel all everything else I'm doing, I think, would not make me happy. So, I, I stopped looking, or even um, if people have asked me, I've sent them to uh, I've given other names, uh, <laughs> and that has been happening pre-consisting the last six years, five, six years. Well, we are uh, running out of time. I do want to give you a, a minute if you, uh, you know, what question did I not ask? If if you were at a fireside chat, if you said, oh, this fireside chat this afternoon, here's what I really want to say. What what did I what did I forget to ask? I think you asked everything. I think the, uh, I think that for anybody that, that's younger, that looks at this, you're entering on a beautiful career. Uh, I think I tell people that being a neurosurgeon um, is is really a, an amazing career. First of all, nobody else can do what you do. Once you're a neurosurgeon, you're seen as a leader, but you have to behave like a leader. Uh, you have to remember that people look up to you, your colleagues do, uh, your uh, your medical students, your residents do, uh, lay people do. Um, um, and so you have to behave like one. Um, and uh, sometimes we forget that that is that that is how people look at it, look at us. There's only three to four thousand of us here in the United States, so we're really a rarity and exception. But don't take that as a way to be um, uh, boastful. You have to be humble about it, and you have to play the part. Great. Well, I want to um, thank you, uh, Nino, for the opportunity to talk with you. Um, I have nothing but fond memories and appreciate your mentorship, you know, not only from when you hired me, but uh, ever since leaving, you've you've remained a friend and a mentor and, uh, you know, the consummate leader, uh, the consummate gentleman. So, I, you know, I, I very much look up to you. Um, right, thank you. I want to thank our listeners and viewers for tuning into this episode and wish everybody a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Nino.